Uh, thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, this is our most recent uh, officer involved shooting that occurred on June 20th. Um, Commander Kyle Hartsock will go through the presentation as he usually does. Um, but we'll start off with Chief Medina. If you want to say a few words or after the fact? Okay. We'll go with Commander Car Kyle Hartsock. My name is Commander Kyle Hartsock of the Criminal Investigation Division, which includes the multi-agency task force who does do criminal investigations into officer-involved shootings. The shooting we're here to talk about today happened on June 20th, 2024 in the 300 block of 98th Street Northwest. It is our eighth officer-involved shooting of 2024. This critical incident community briefing will provide information about a male who fled from officers in a stolen vehicle then held a hostage with a gun, which resulted in an officer-involved shooting. You're about to see relevant video footage and photos and learn about other evidence and police procedures related to the case so you can have a better understanding of what occurred based on what we know right now. The police department conducts very thorough criminal and use of force investigations, which typically require investigators to interview multiple witnesses, analyze, uh, review hours of video footage and analyze a significant amount of forensic evidence. We're still at the early stages of this investigation, which can often take several months to complete. Our understanding of the incident may change as this additional evidence is collected, analyzed, and reviewed. We also do not draw any conclusions about whether the officers acted consistent with our policies and the law until all the facts are known and the investigation is complete. A word of caution. The images and video may be disturbing. When police officers use force to arrest a subject or defend against an attack, it can be graphic and difficult to watch. In addition, there may be strong language by those shown in the video. One officer discharged their firearm during this incident. Zachary Herbst, who's been with the department since 2014, he has been involved in one prior officer-involved shooting. At the time and currently, he was assigned to the Special Weapons and Tactics, or SWAT team, and he is back on duty. The subject who was shot and killed was 42-year-old Del Medor of Albuquerque. This incident started off and took place in the Southwest Area Command. Around 8.53 a.m., officers assigned to the Southwest uh, Proactive Response Team, which is a team that wears a full uniform and drives marked units, were conducting patrol in the dirt lots behind the Flying J Travel Center near 98th Street and Central. While conducting this patrol for encampments, trespassing, and suspicious vehicles, they observed a Ford SUV parked near an encampment. Officers ran the license plate and found it was reported stolen out of the University of New Mexico Police Department in January of this year. By the time the stolen plate hit came back to the officer, the Ford Escape had driven away in the opposite direction of the officer through a dirt field towards the towards 98th Street, kind of closer to I-40. The officer had gone the other way, but waited at the traffic light at 98th and Avalon as he saw the vehicle driving towards him, and he was going to attempt a traffic stop at that point. The vehicle drove up and the officer uh, engaged it, tried to pull it over. The vehicle did start to slow down like it was gonna pull over, but then accelerated and fled away east on Volcano from 98th Street. The vehicle then went northbound on 90th Street, northwest from Volcano, with our officers still engaged with their police lights in an attempt to have the car pull over and stop. The vehicle continued to flee eastbound and officers disengaged and re-engaged the vehicle multiple times as it would change its driving behavior. Officers were aware that air support was en route. Air support arrived on scene as the Ford Escape approached the area of our southwest substation, which was closer to Coors, and officers disengaged their lights in an attempt to have the driver slow down and drive not so recklessly. Another officer was staged ahead of the vehicle before it got to Coors ready to deploy stop sticks if the car had not stopped by that point. The Ford Escape approached that officer and ended up actually driving on the opposite lanes of traffic to avoid the officer's stop sticks, but the officer was still nonetheless successful in deploying the stop sticks, deflating at least one of the tires. We'll play that video for you now of the stop stick deployment.
And again, you can see the car went on the opposite lanes of traffic. You can see uh, traffic having to slow down and stop out of his way. Here is a video from our air support unit that shows that stop stick deployment and the Ford vehicle fleeing officers as it continues to drive reckless. The helicopter is just arriving on scene, so the camera is trying to acquire it. But as you watch the video, you can see our officer staged in the median. Just kind of keep your eyes right there and you'll see the fleeing vehicle coming down. We did overlay real-time radio transmissions on top of this audio to try to give it a little bit more context. The timing isn't always perfect but you're hearing radio transmissions that were recorded separately from this video. We'll play it for you now. At the end of that video, you actually saw we try to stop stick it again, and we're going to play you that OBRD here in a second. Um, as the, the vehicle's approaching Blue Water right here, more officers are awaiting, and they deploy stop sticks successfully. We'll play that for you now. Ford Escape went south on Coors, turning west on Central, continuing to drive reckless while no officers were engaged, eventually driving all the way back up near 98th and Central, but pulling into the El Mesquite parking lot, which is a shopping center. While the air unit was watching, they advised that a male driver and female passenger both left the Ford Escape and were moving into a parked truck that was unlocked, and they appeared to be attempting to flee in that car. Uh, as officers were arriving, the vehicle was able to flee, nearly injuring officers during its exit. We're going to play you the two officers' videos who tried to detain them in the parking lot, and then we'll show you the air video after. Here's a video of one of the first officers approaching the vehicle as they switched vehicles, trying to detain him. One thing you might kind of ask what's on his lap, um, Dell is holding a dog on his lap in the car as officers are trying to order him out. the video from the officer that goes to the passenger side of the truck. The audio will kick on here in a second. The subjects now in this newly stolen vehicle flee north on 98th Street, kind of making that full circle back around. Officers attempt stop sticks nearby right after he pulls on the street, but uh, he's able to avoid them. A second set of officers is set up 
just past them, a little bit further to the north, they were able to successfully deploy stop sticks. Uh, as he tried to avoid those stop sticks, he actually somewhat loses control of the truck and hits a light post in the median, which we're going to show you the OBRD video of that now. vehicle then goes off-road and parks near a culvert that runs underneath 98th Street. The occupants exit the vehicle and it appears the male is armed and possibly pointing the gun at the female. The male and female both enter the culvert. At that point, officers set up a perimeter, start asking for more resources, and start and continue to ask both subjects to drop any weapons they have and to voluntarily surrender. This is about 9.04 a.m that that happens. And I'm going to play you about a close to a three minute air support video that just really puts the end of this whole chase, the switching of the vehicles and them exiting the car into the culvert all into one, one, uh, one big context. This is drone video that we took approximately one hour after this incident, it's around 10 a.m. There's no audio when the drones record, but it's going to show the, the final moments of the two subjects coming out of the culvert. You'll notice Dell is armed with the black firearm and is holding it to the female as they approach that black vehicle they had just fled. Again, at this point, it's been about an hour or close to an hour. Um, multiple officers are set up. Uh, crisis negotiation team has tried to initiate communications. Uh, nothing is working at this point when they decide to come out still armed. Again, there's no audio. We'll play this for you.
you see the gun in his right hand. Before shots were fired, two officers did fire 40 millimeter less than lethal rounds at Dell in an attempt to either disarm him or get him to voluntary surrender. We'll play you those two deployments first. You will hear the shots. We'll play the, the officers OBRD who fired um, as the final video. You didn't drop the, you let her go. This is the second officer who used their 40 millimeter less than lethal rounds. This is the OBRD from Officer Herbst who does fire his weapon. He stated in his MATF interview that he felt the female was in immediate fear of being killed or seriously harmed by the male and that she had no reasonable opportunity to escape that harm and that's why he fired. This is a short clip of OBRD as officers moved up and took Dale into custody.
I apologize, that was the female being taken into custody. Here's now a short clip of officers taking Dell into custody and starting uh, first aid. Check him for a pulse. Check him for a pulse. like a very light one, very faint kid. In this scene photograph taken after the incident, a total of five 223 casings were located on scene from the police rifle that was fired, and a total of three 40 millimeter less than lethal uh, casings were also found. The approximate distance that police were away from Dell when they fired was about 81 feet. This is the black Nissan Frontier, the second vehicle that they drove away in that was at the, the point that the shooting occurred. Impacts were located inside the Nissan Frontier that we believe are from the 40 millimeter impact launchers. This is another impact to the inside of the Frontier. We did find at least one rifle projectile inside the Nissan Frontier. This is the Ford Escape that initiated the incident. You can note the passenger side tires are completely shredded as the, stocks, the stop sticks were effective in, in doing their job. A search warrant was conducted on this vehicle. It had been reported, um, or hadn't been reported yet, but the investigation shows it was likely embezzled at the time and the license plate on it had been stolen. This black, uh, what looks like a firearm was found inside the car ended up being a CO2 powered BB gun tucked between the driver's seat and the center console. This 1911 style, also a BB gun, was located on the back seat of the passenger side of the Ford Escape. This is another BB gun located in the rear area of the Ford Escape. We did find 20 gauge shotgun rounds, a nine millimeter round, and some 223 uh, rounds inside of a magazine and some casings inside the car as well, but no firearms. And finally, this is the six hour looking BB gun that Dell was armed with during the incident. Medical aid was rendered, but Dell was pronounced deceased on scene. The female passenger did have outstanding warrants for her arrest and was booked. She did not make any statements to officers that day. She was not charged with, with anything related to this incident though. Over the next several months, the multi-agency task force will continue to investigate and analyze this incident. Detectives will interview any new witnesses that come forward and complete any forensic test. After the investigation is complete, the case will be forwarded to the district attorney's office to make any determination of criminal charges. Our Internal Affairs 4th Division will also investigate the shooting to determine whether the department policies were followed. The results of the administrative investigation will be forwarded to the city's superintendent of police reform to make final decisions on discipline. Our force review board made up of deputy chiefs will also review the incident to identify trends and potential policy changes that may be needed in response to any shortcomings that are identified. Any questions? Um, <clears throat> at the point before uh, Herb's fire, it sounded like one of the officers said, um, we, we have a shot taken, and then it sounds like he kind of followed up with, with a 40, with a 40 kind of clarifying, and then as, I mean, I, I, and it's kind of hard to tell exactly, so that's why I'm asking. It seems like as he's firing the rifle, they're kind of yelling 40. Was there any kind of confusion on the part of the officers that was related to the department after this on I'm, how that played out? I mean, I think the, the exact order of things and whose voice you were hearing is still part of the investigation. But, you know, from my observations, they're just trying to clearly communicate about who should be doing what. And it appears the 40s are fired first in an attempt to get him to disarm or, or surrender. The officer who fired has his own vantage point and uh, makes decisions based on what he's seen while trying to gauge as much information as he can. Um, so I see it and that's always part of the hard part is we gotta figure out whose voice is saying what and in what order and that's absolutely part of what both investigations try to look at. Just one follow-up. When the officer says, if you have a shot, take it, is he talking to Herbst? Have you guys gotten to that yet? Is he, is he advising Herbst? 
I can't give you a 100% conclusive answer at this point, but he does say right after with a 40. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, mm -hmm. the implication is he's talking yeah. to the officers with the less than lethal rounds. Again, Herbst is a SWAT officer. I think he's likely comfortable and confident to know when he's going to take the shot. Yes? So obviously the decision happened a split of a second, but can you talk uh, about the part where they switched vehicles, why the officer couldn't possibly do more to try and pull them out instead of just letting them drive away? I think it was a really fast situation. Again, we're not going to draw conclusions on what they did or didn't do, but I think it's important to point out that the female that was still unclear her involvement and that the driver who appeared to be the aggressor here also had a dog on his lap and the officer is trying to weigh reaching in and grabbing with the owner's dog and trying to you know violently pull someone out right um, there's other considerations they got to take in there and also you can tell the second the vehicle starts the officer is disengaged because they correctly predict this car is about to accelerate in some direction away and the passenger side officer, in my view, just barely escapes getting clipped by that door and being drugged between the two vehicles. And officers experience this stuff. They see it before. It's part of the training. So I think they're having to weigh a lot of things at once. You know, and that's actually one of the most dangerous situations that our officers could be in is trying to get somebody out of a car and getting stuck inside the car. I mean, years ago, we actually had somebody taken from 12th Street to, I think it was Rio Grande before it ended in OIS. So it is a very dangerous situation. They can't get in the car with the individual uh, completely uh, to try to get them out. They're trying to weigh, uh, making sure that they keep themselves safe. Because the moment that car goes mobile, uh, the biggest fear is that they could themselves could get run over uh, trying to get out of the vehicle. Any other questions? Yes. You know, I think the most important thing to remember is that each officer has a different view. And while we're always going to try to deploy less lethal, uh, there is no way to script one of these situations. And I think this video really shows the decisions our officers have to make. And I hope the public really looks at it and sees how they're doing their very best to deploy less lethal. It appears that they did deploy less lethal twice. But these situations are evolving so quickly that instantaneously a decision has to be made that somebody may have to go to lethal force. It is imperative that that vehicle doesn't go mobile again with a possible hostage and that we stop the situation at that time. And quite frankly, although they're trying to deploy less lethal, without a doubt, deadly force is authorized uh, very early in this incident as this individual has the firearm pointed at her stomach. So I think that's one of the benefits we could look at from what we've learned through our reform process in DOJ is Years ago, deadly force would have been used a lot earlier. Officers attempted to use less lethal force twice uh, before that, but the, in the c incident clearly indicated that the possibility for using deadly force was way earlier into this incident. Chief? Yes? Can you talk about the importance of having air support as well as the usage of the drone during this incident? Irreplaceable the videos that we get. We've seen it over and over. It helps us explain uh, and give a view that the public didn't see before. We will continue to grow our drone program. It will continue to improve. We will learn more more different ways uh, to use it. But uh, the transparency that our drone program is bringing to these uh, incidents uh, is irreplaceable in a lot of ways. I think this is the third OIS we capture with drone video, tramway, uh, the Northeast car and this one. So it, they're extremely valuable in us being able to give uh, the public a different view of what's occurring. I think, I don't know if he's asking this, but I think also helping the officers on scene. Oh, right. giving, right. give, give the information, and you could clearly see the, improve, the improvement of, of, of how we get better and better. The information they're receiving on this is just uh, irreplaceable. They're, they know this individual is armed with a possible firearm, they know what this individual's actions are. So yeah, I think the drone brings another element of uh, intelligence gathering and getting more information uh, to our officers that clearly uh, in a lot of cases, not every case, is, is gonna help them make better decisions. Okay. Um, was there an official cause of death, uh, which kind of like <coughs> led to, to the death of the If the, all my report's done, we can just release it. Okay. All right, so we got kind of two parts. One, um, in that first clip of the exchange of cars, there's a shot of the dog. 
Um, is was there any kind of sign of like danger to the officers with that dog being there? Would that change the situation if it was more dangerous if the dog? Kind of like my first part. I mean, I think I just kind of what I said before, right? This is a the dog's with an owner. The officers don't know this dog, and a lot's going on at once. The car's getting started up. That the, the pursuits are very high adrenaline um, events. But that's part of what both investigations also look at is how, if at all, that was a factor in decisions that were made. Okay, but my second part of uh, the dog was clearly in the second car in the exchange when they took off. Is there any word on the dog? Is it was it at the final scene? It was. was. It, car? Okay. it was. It was walking around in the mesa, and I believe family members or animal control came out to try to get the dog. Okay. The dog remained on scene as I was out there. You could see it roaming around. Well, it, seemed like it, wasn't, it seemed like it wasn't a threat during the active part of the scene, right? <coughs> I, so that's part of what the investigation yeah. is, right? It, I've been in situations every officer has with dogs that you don't know, and you, you don't know the dog, and the dog doesn't know you. And so it's really hard to kind of give you a conclusion on that. Huh. But Just curious. Yeah. You stole my after question. I was going to ask about the dog. I was going to ask about the dog. <laughs> so, ah, you stole my after question. Some people thought it was a coyote. Oh my God. It was well, a dog. Have. Did you guys find anything else besides the BB guns inside the vehicle? Any drugs? And can you talk to? Uh, can you talk about the suspects prior? I can't speak on if there was narcotics in there. There might have been, but I'd have to double double check with the team. Um, there was live ammunition found in there for firearms, but we didn't find a, a functional firearm. We found very very realistic looking BB guns. Several of them that we showed you today, um, and I believe Gell at the time was wanted for, I'm looking back at my auto sergeant, theft. auto theft. He had auto theft warrants out for his arrest at the time. He was actually well known to the auto theft unit. Yeah. They didn't know who he was before, but once we identified him, then yeah, he has yeah. a history. Just a follow up question. I don't know if you guys mentioned it, but the black Toyota, the pickup truck, was it registered to any of them? The Nissan Frontier? Was it a Frontier? I thought it was a Toyota. I, but the air support yeah. says Toyota ends up being a okay. Nissan Frontier. Right. Was it registered to any of them? It was not, but that's still part of, I think, what we're trying to track down. But uh, it was definitely not registered to the male or the female. Um, so the dog was in the Frontier when they got into it? It's unclear. It okay, so you don't know if the dog was with the tail when it, they got into it? It's un all we have is really the air support video. It's unclear if he carries the dog over. Again, I think the hell everyone's trying to zoom in. So it's just kind of unclear. And did he have keys to the frontier? That's the other part. Like, did he like steal it right then and there somehow, or did he have keys to it and it was just like waiting there for them? We'll have to get you that answer just after. I'm not sure if he had keys in the car or not. They appear to go right towards that car though. Yeah. And the female, um, you know, it seemed like with the drone video, they were talking to each other and saying, did she talk to officers afterwards and kind of talk about what was happening? She didn't. There? She did not volunteer to make a statement to us. There were keys in the truck. Uh, it was reported stolen at a Walmart after a person lost their keys. And part of what the investigation is looking into is was that truck staged as essentially a second or a getaway vehicle um, during any kind of police involvement. We're not sure of that, but it's something that we suspect could have been going on. Do you police see that a lot where like someone will like drop a car they've stolen off somewhere just to have it there in case they need it? Is that something that... Oh yeah, that's something we've commonly seen. Drop off points of stolen cars is something we track. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and there's commonality with it. We've seen it quite a bit over the years. I think we even have old video from like 2018, one of our first auto theft operations. Uh, the very, one of the first cars stolen, air support tracked them over a fence into a cul-de-sac and they left an additional stolen car. At one point you mentioned that the first vehicle, the SUV, was embezzled and had different plates on that. Can you explain for me? So the plate was reported stolen. So an officer runs the plate, it says that license plate was stolen off a different car is usually what that means. Not necessarily the car is stolen, but we find lots of stolen plates on stolen cars because people are changing the plates out. When the 
VIN number was ran, it was not reported stolen, but when they got a hold of the owner, it looks like it might have been embezzled by either the male or the female. Anything else? Okay, thank you, everybody.